September 21st, 2023, and here we are. <laughs> sustainability like Committee and um, the Reduced Sustainability Committee for tonight. Um, can we get, have a roll call? Yes. For this evening. Thank you. Um, Chairperson Denise Menino. Here. Member Carol Mickett. Present. Member Taylor Mandelou is absent. Um, member Dory Larson is absent. Member Karen Gallagher, absent. Alternate member Robin Sanger. Here. Alternate number two, Jennifer Bracey is absent. Okay, we have three, that's a call. And last month we did hear from um, Dory that she was not going to be here mm -hmm. tonight, so could we have a motion to excuse her absence for this evening? I move to excuse Dory Larson tonight from the meeting. I second it. Thank you, all in favor? Aye. 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 And I also heard from uh, Karen Gallagher that she was unable to be here because she's out of town, and um, could we have a motion to excuse her absence, please? I make a motion to excuse the absence of Karen Gallagher. I second that. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Has everyone had a chance to um, check the minutes from last month? Yes. yes. And are there any, any suggestions, amendments, or changes at all, or was it accurate? Yes. So, um, I make a motion that we approve the minutes. I second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. So we um, don't public appear comment. to have public comments at this point, and we're not on um, any virtual <laughs> experience that would permit that, but um, sure. we'll just move on. Mm -hmm. The next... Um, Discussion on water supply presentation. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's exciting. It is. Mm -hmm. Sorry, everybody's missing it. If you watch it. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, Daryl, you want to? Yep. No, we'll both stand for this one. Still not sure. Turn the mic. Thank you for having us again here today. Uh, I'm Thomas Kiger. I'm the Assistant Director for Public Services, and the Public Services Department includes the Water and Wastewater Utilities. And I also have Daryl Vasey, who is our Water Division Manager here. He'll be joining us for part of the presentation. Uh, before we get started, do we have any questions? Okay. Um, all right, so today we're going to be talking a little bit about our water supply in Tarpon Springs and kind of a little bit more broadly about the history of water supply here and our uh, regional water issues in the Tampa Bay region. Um, for those of you who don't know, before my time here, I worked... Uh, for a number of years at the state's water management district. So um, had a little bit of a background in regional water supply planning and regional issues and things like that. Where was it? Swift Mud? Uh, yes, Swift uh, Mud? I was at Swift Mud uh, for a while, like right before I came here. And before that, I actually spent a few years up at the Suwannee River Water Management District. All right, so we have uh, two primary sources of water in our city. Uh, so most folks wanna know, where does our water come from? The two sources of water that we have, we have fresh groundwater wells, which are kind of our historic uh, water supply. Those tend to go, those wells go back, you know, uh, well into the 20th century. That feels a little weird to say. Um, but they're some, one of our wells dates actually to the early 1900s. And then we have our more modern, more recent uh, brackish groundwater supply, which is salty water from the upper Florida aquifer that we put through our reverse osmosis water treatment facility, which you can see right there. And uh, the, all that stainless steel piping and panels and stuff like that, that's one of our brackish water wells. Do we have a map of where these wells are set later on? Uh, I'll, I'm, we might. Um, okay. Let me, I'm not sure if we have that slide. Okay. Uh, so here's There's a little bit map. of history about the, the city. So. We've had brackish groundwater wells. The earliest map I've seen is an old Sanborn fire insurance map that goes back to us having a water supply as early as I think 1914. Um, 
Since then, there's been a number of attempts to develop additional water supply. Tarpon's always been relatively dependent on outside water supply for its growth uh, and to serve its, to meet its needs. So in the early, in the 20s, there was a surface water source on Lake Tarpon that was discontinued relatively quickly. Uh, in the late 70s, there was a, they did a study to try and look and look at the hydrogeology to see whether sorts of water supplies might be, val uh, might be viable. Um, by the 80s, they started on additional well field design. Uh, we added some wells uh, over, the, over a number of years. And we, uh, we sort of slowly built out over the, the 80s up into the 2000s a number of uh, localized, relatively shallow freshwater wells to supplement our water. Uh, but historically, most of our water uh, came from Pinellas County. We were importing water at a wholesale rate from the county regional water system. And um, there was a number of regional challenges with water supply uh, throughout the Tampa Bay region, going all the way back to the 80s and becoming particularly acute in the 90s and early 2000s. Uh, there was historically a very high over-reliance on f cheap, fresh groundwater throughout the Tampa Bay region from the upper Florida aquifer. And because of our unique hydrogeology here, we have a very karstic environment, which means we have a lot of limestone and a lot of very close interconnectivity hydrogeologically between our groundwater supplies and our surface water resources, like lakes and springs and rivers. They're all, a lot of those are spring-fed. Yes? Are we selling water to any uh, corporations? I was just, I'm just curious. I know Zephyr Hills is uh, bottled water. Hmm. Uh, we uh, we don't have anything, I believe, that would be something like a bo bottled water facility. I mean, uh, in our town, the, the closest thing we have to that is there's a small service area that's also just another public access service area kind of north of into Pasco County that we export a small quantity of water to for, like, neighborhood use and stuff like that. But it's all residents. Uh, so we, we do have one wholesale customer, but they're a small local utility run by a semi-public state agent agency called FGUA. Uh, but yeah, I guess I'm thinking more regionally because the water in the Florida aquifer is, you know, um, doesn't have borders. No. So, I mean, and, and, and anybody that's buying it would be depleting um, the resource for even our community. I'm just I, I'm just curious how, if we know. You mean Tarp, Tarpon Corp, Spring specifically? Yeah, or? well, no, not Tarpon Spring specifically, but um, throughout the state, do you know of um, sources, uh, corporations that might be buying water that might be uh, creating depletion? Because this has happened in other places in the world. Yes, I, I don't have those numbers readily available, but there's a, a lot of folks in throughout Florida. You know, groundwaters are supplied throughout the vast majority of the whole state. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, there are some localized areas like City of Tampa has surface water supply off the Hillsborough River and uh, some other areas. But uh, our water use mix throughout the state is a mix of public supply use, you know, which serves residences, but also commerce like mm -hmm. breweries and all sorts of other beneficial activities and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, food processing facilities and all those sorts of things. And there are self-supplied in, uh, industrial and commercial entities that use water throughout the state. And some of those use water from the upper Florida aquifer. Like if you go up in North Florida, we have mm -hmm. some legacy heavy industry like paper mills and large industrial uh, users and things like that. Um, yeah, we do have a little bit of bottled water use throughout the state, um, but uh, from what I recall, and you know, I don't have those numbers readily available, it's a small, ra rather small fraction of our total water use throughout the state. Okay, sorry for the interruption. Oh, yeah. no worries. Um, and uh, yeah, so historically, especially in our local area, the, the upper Florida aquifer extends all the way up into South Carolina. It's a big aquifer system. And uh, but locally, it was quite overpumped. Uh, you know, there was more use than was you know, re you know, replenishable from local recharge, and it was causing degradation to local water resources. So, here you can see uh, that top left photo. That's supposed to be a creek. Mm -hmm. uh, that bottom left photo is supposed to be a lake, and you can see there's no water in them, uh, which is not ideal. Uh, not good for the water resources. Not good for the environment. Not good for wildlife. Um, it leads to changes in habitat types over time. Uh, and you also started to have the phenomenon that you see sometimes in other states where you were starting to get competition for water. So we mm -hmm. have lots of different entities with well fields near each other that all were trying to serve their own public communities, mm -hmm. and there's a limited supply, so that creates this sort of friction and competition. Yes? So when you say well fields, that's all freshwater. Freshwater uh, wells? 
Not necessarily. You can we like the city uh, operates a brackish, brackish water, well, water wells. Sure. Yeah. Okay, so a well so field is just a series of wells. In the history part, mid '80s well field design and construction were those freshwater or mixture? Those were fresh. For okay. those were for the city. Those were fresh wells. And the late '80s, the same things. They're freshwater. Yeah, we we didn't do any desalination or any. Um, okay brackish water supply until we brought on our RO plant in the But now we have wells that are brackish. Mm -hmm. okay. We have a brackish water well Thank field you. now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, in the late 80s uh, through 2007, SWIFMA, the local water management entity, the Southwest Florida Water Management District, mm -hmm. established the Northern Tampa Bay Water Use Caution Area, which effectively means they're publicly declaring that there's insufficient water resources to meet the regional needs and the projected future needs without uh, unacceptable impacts to natural systems. Mm -hmm. And then they built on that. And here you can see there's a little like diagram of uh, mm -hmm. what our aquifer kind of looks like. You can see there's a spring with a diver going down into it. I always kind of like that one. And, but you can see the interconnectivity between springs and lakes. And you see the wells uh, penetrate through the aquifer. And they derive their water from the same aquifer systems that mm -hmm. um, feed those, uh, those natural systems. And so uh, they created the Swift Mud, the Water Management District created a plan in 1999 called the Northern Tampa Bay Recovery Strategy to reduce fresh groundwater use throughout the region. And the goals were to conserve water, you know, so use less water for the same uses, uh, develop alternative water supplies, so find water sources to meet needs that didn't come from the upper Florida aquifer. And also there was a concept of source substitution, use lower quality water sources like reclaimed water to replace potable water uses where you can. So mm -hmm. for like irrigation and things like that, if you need to irrigate a golf course, you don't need the high quality water from the upper Florida. Reclaimed water is perfectly acceptable. And their overall goal is to meet both the human needs for our population, all the people who live here and raise families here and whatnot, and also to meet our environmental needs and meet all the environmental standards for the water resources of the area. Um, one of, uh, so as they got into the Northern Tampa Bay recovery strategy, they did a number of things. One of the big things they did was created a regional utility called Tampa Bay Water in 1998. Uh, that's a map of Tampa Bay Water. And they sort of regionalized the system. So they tied all these different utilities together. They put all their well fields under common operation so they could work together instead of against each other. And um, uh, they devoted a lot of funding for cost share to local entities and to Tampa Bay Water to help um, make these projects vi financially viable. And uh, many of the area utilities implemented projects to reduce fresh groundwater use. And that can be things like uh, building out a reclaimed water system, implementing conservation programs, and many utilities, including Tarpon Springs, elected to implement their own local alternative water supply uh, projects, uh, such as a local desalination facility. So utilities that had, that implemented projects like that include us here in Tarpon Springs, Oldsmar uh, implemented a desalination uh, brackish groundwater facility, Dunedin has one as well, uh, Clearwater has one that supplies a portion of their water needs, and uh, even Tampa Bay Water has a mix of water supplies. They have some water from the old well fields, they have some water from a big regional surface water plant, they've got a big reservoir to supplement that surface water supply, and they've got a uh, seawater scale uh, uh, desalination reverse osmosis facility that's all tied in the regional system. So here you can see some photos of uh, some of those regional water supply pro projects that were implemented around the area. The top left is Oldsmar's reverse osmosis plant. Uh, the, oh boy, where, what is the top right? I can't recall. I think that might be it. No, that's not us. That's Tampa Bay Water. Um, all, the, all the membranes all look the same. I think that's Tampa Bay Water. Bottom, le bottom right is uh, Dunedin, and the bottom left is the big regional C.W. Bill Young Reservoir, which is a big surface water reservoir. For and the, where's that? Uh, that's kind of out uh, towards, like, the Lithia area. Like, it takes water from the Alafaya River uh, on the eastern side of Tampa Bay. Uh, and it's all plumb together with large regional pipelines. Mm -hmm. So what about Tarpon? How did we get to where we are? So we started planning for an, a new water plant in the early 2000s. Uh, we started working with the regional entity, the Water Management District, on cooperative funding to help build the plant. It would have been a very large financial lift for the city by itself. Um, How much did it cost? Uh, 
That's a great question. I want to say it was pretty, I think the initial cost estimate early on was like $38 million. I think it came in a little bit closer to 50 all in, but we got 50-50 cost share from the water management district, which is great. I mean, in the big scheme of things, that's not very much for what we get. Is that no, it was it was very good deal, and it was right before a lot of construction being very expensive. So we got a, a very good value for that for the amount of water treatment capacity that we have. Mm -hmm. um, great question. And yeah, and we implemented this project as a design build project, which meant we kind of worked with a contractor and, an, and a group of engineers together to try and find ways to be efficient and build it over together over time. And the project came on came online in mid 2015. Oh, so, so it took 15 years to build from conception to roughly yeah, yeah. that's 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 pretty typical yeah um, especially with the financing and stuff like that the uh, permits a mm -hmm. lot of testing a lot of hydrogeology um, a rule of thumb we used to use the water management district was it takes uh, about seven to 15 years to implement a regional project mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. that's uh, for water supply mm -hmm. so that's that's pretty standard um, so here's how our water supply used to look. Let's see if this works. So we would take whatever we could out of our local freshwater wells, and then we would use water imported from Pinellas County, which was tied in with that big regional system to fill up the, the balance. Mm. Um, and we were using about 3 million gallons a day. Wow. And here's what we're doing today. This is pretty cool. I did not make this slide. Um, we're still taking some of our water from our legacy freshwater wells because that's you know a little bit more affordable. It doesn't require as much treatment. Mm -hmm. And uh, we use the reverse osmosis facility to fill in the balance that used to be supplied by the county. And we're actually, our overall water use is down a little bit. So we're down to about 2.8 uh, million gallons a day And on why average. is our water use down? Conservation. Okay. Mm. So reclaim water use, all sorts of stuff like that. We have more. We have more customers. We have um, higher population, uh, but the conservation efforts, people being more efficient with their water use over time. Mm -hmm. uh, part of that has to do with our rate structure. We have a conservation rate structure that creates an economic incentive for water conservation. If you use more water, you get charged for like the last thousand gallons than for the first thousand gallons. Mm -hmm. Uh, so very strong economic driver to conserve. And also we've built out our reclaim water system to help s offset some of those potable water needs to reduce the burden on our fresh water supplies. Hmm. Um, so yeah, that's our kind of water supply mix right now. And now we'll have Daryl Vasey come and talk to you a little bit about the reverse osmosis plant. Okay. Thank you, Tommy. Okay, so you can see from the, I, I love the graphics. You can see uh, we're, put, let's start at the uh, bottom left. We're pulling brackish water out of the aquifer. It uh, goes through a series of pipelines. It ties all the different wells, fields together, and it ends up at the RO plant. Uh, first step, kind of the top left there, we, we put it through a series of uh, cartridge filters, which remove, you get with, with uh, wells, you're pulling out of the ground, you get sand, you get fine particulates. You don't want that to get into the membranes. The membranes are uh, very fine. Uh, you really don't want anything to foul or contaminate them. This replacement's costly. So we do some filtering. We feed, uh, we have the feed water. You'll, you'll notice there in, in this graphic, it says 4.2 million gallons a day. Um, so you're pumping a lot of raw water into the, uh, into the membranes. And you'll see there's two streams that come out of that. So when you go through reverse osmosis, you get pure water coming out. That's the majority of it, the, the 3.1 million gallons a day on the right. Um, but you also get what we call concentrate that comes out of the bottom. That's more of a concentrated brine solution approaching seawater. Um, so that there's, there's the, the good, the treated water. That's what we're going to continue to process and take out to distribution to the community, and then there's the concentrate. Uh, so kind of complete, uh, uh, we'll see some pictures in a second of what the membranes look like, but the treated water comes out. Now, when you treat it through reverse- Where the, the briny water go? Uh, great question. Uh, so we um, inject it, we have a deep well injection on Dixie Highway. Oh. Um, so it goes down. Now the, we're pulling uh, typically a, a well for um, for the Florida, Florida aquifer is 100 to 150 feet, mm -hmm. and we're down what, about 1,200 feet, 1,500. Yeah. It, it's yeah. it's several aquifers down at a at a level that's deemed not to it w it won't 
contaminate the, the, the aquifer that we're pulling from above. So but essentially it's, it's going back into the groundwater and it's, it's eventually going to make its way back out to seawater. Okay. Uh, you know, but it's, it's like seawater, right? Yes. So why can't you just put it in the Gulf? Because it'd be very concentrated. Um, oh, I see. It's yeah. too much salt. Yeah, it's it's one of the challenges, as I understand, with, yeah, with desalination. You can't just process that and then dump that mm. that discharge. You know, it's going to have a harmful effect on all the uh, aquatic life where you're dumping it. So, because it uh, has too much salt in it, right? Yes, yes. Mm. So anyway, we continue to process it. As I said, when it comes out of the RO process, it's very pure. There's everything has been stripped out of it. It's it's water, and there's no a lot of the chemicals that, that, that we'll have to add some things back into it to make it uh, the right pH, to make it the right hardness level, you know, with calcium and things like that. So uh, it goes through, you see, the, the degasification process and chlorination. And basically, when it comes out of there, it's ready for distribution. And we have um, 5 million gallons of water storage on site. Uh, there's there's a tank within a tank. It's essentially two 2.5 million gallon tanks, but it looks like one big tank. Uh, but it goes into that, and from there we distribute it. And the pumps. Uh, I, I came from up north. You're used to seeing water towers. You don't see a whole lot of that in Florida, right? We're we're pumping out at 60 pounds, uh, 60 psi. That's what's going out into distribution, and it's feeding the entire community. Um, we're not relying on towers to, to give us the pressure. So as the slide shows distribution, it's taken it uh, out to all of our all of our customers in the city of Tarpon Springs. Huh. What creates the pressure if it's not gravity? Pump, it's it's the pump the pumps at the plant, and there'll be a picture of it in a couple slides. But yeah, these large horsepower pumps that are basically pressurizing the entire system. So here's a photo on, on the right. Those are what we call the membrane skids or arrays. Um, there's actually two stages that all the water goes through, um, and this will kind of feed into my second presentation on what we're trying to do for uh, with solar power. Mm -hmm. um, but it takes a lot of pressure to force the water through the membranes. It's um, about 400 psi at the first stage, so you're putting a lot of pressure beyond that. And then it uh, turns around and goes into the second stage, and it, we use um, we use it to be akin to a turbocharger on a car. It takes the velocity of the water as it comes out of that, wow. and it spins it up faster to about 525 psi. Um, question? Yes, I have a question. So, does the temperature of the water have any impact on the efficacy of the membranes? In other words, the, if the water is getting warmer. Does that do? The, does it deteriorate quicker, or does it? Is, is yeah. It, what temp? Does it have to go through a cooling process before it goes to the membranes? No, and, and you have, don't forget, most of this is coming from groundwater, well down. So it's it's actually, if you were to put your hand on a pipe, it's it's cool to the touch. Yeah, it's probably in the fifties. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, it's relatively cool. I don't know the answer to the question if, if temperature does impact, but it's really a, a non-issue. It's not like it's an issue. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank so, you. Yeah. Uh, in general, um, hotter water is uh, more easily put. You get a higher recovery or a higher yield uh, for, for reverse osmosis processes. But it's it, like Daryl's saying, because it's all groundwater, it's all coming out of state temperature. Yeah. It's not really a, con a consideration for us. Thanks, Tom. Mm -hmm. Yep, so you'll see the, uh, the the membrane skids on the right and the large horsepower pumps that are pumping the water. We have three skids. Um, typically, we're running one to two, so at night is when our water flow is going way down. We'll use that time to build the tanks back up to full capacity. Uh, we like to run just one skid if we as long as we can because it takes less energy. Uh, but when we when we want to build the levels up, we'll we'll run two. Uh, so you always have one in reserve um, in case there's any kind of problems with that. But uh, okay, so, now the plant is. Uh, this doesn't show. I wish we had a great aerial view. Um, that's by the way, Fire Station 71 in the background. Our next door neighbors. Uh, um, but we have uh, the, the the plant that is uh, with the with the membrane skids, and then on the backside we'll see the large distribution tank in a second. 
But on one side is all the acids that we use to treat. There's, I won't go into all the chemistry, but you need acids, acids, uh, sulfuric acid we use to process the water. And then on the other side, this side is the basic side, which is after it's, um, um, after it's gone through the membranes to, to get it to uh, get all the properties uh, where we need it. Um, this is the distribution side. These are the large pumps that pump water out to the city. And there's, uh, this is essentially, as I said, this is our, this is the distribution side of the plant. So you can, you can turn, we could turn all the skids off, all the membrane skids off. You can, you can run just to distribution, you know, so you could fill the tanks up and then not, obviously you couldn't do that very long, but, um, you know, this, it's kind of like two facilities within one facility. Yes. Reclaimed water has that purple color to it. You can tell what's going through the pipe by the pipe color. Is that blue color for good? Is that for fresh water? For yes. Water? In fact, there's even um, there's even a couple of colors of blue. Uh, after it comes out of the RO process, it's like a light a lighter blue. That's uh, it's it's been processed, but it hasn't been. It's not ready for distribution. And after it's been treated, you get that. that we we don't do any reclaimed water at this site. That. No, 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 but I'm in around town. You yeah, know, right, yeah, right. That have that, that, or the pipes that have that, that purplish yeah, color. Yeah, the purple, right. Yeah. Um, so in terms of water quality, we do have a lab on site. Uh, you'll see, uh, well, the, the picture on the left is the lab. The picture on the uh, top right, we have a lot of these. It, it, you'll, if you walk through the facility, you'll see places where we can pull water samples everywhere. Uh, just an example of one, so you can poo. But but as far as what we do, we test pH, alkalinity, temperature, conductivity. You know these. Oops, went too far. These are the things we test on a routine basis. Obviously, for drinking water, there is extensive testing that has to be done, and we supply uh, samples to outside labs um, hmm. that are certified that do all of our. Um, uh, more uh, more complex testing and things like that. So this is the kind of things we test on a daily basis to make sure the water quality meets all the appropriate standards. And then there's more that's done, um, you know, by outside agencies. With that, I think. So do you all drink your eight glasses of water a day while you're at the? Oh, I'm glad you asked that question. Anna. I could burn more of mine to coffee first, I'm unfortunately. I'm to bring to drink <laughs> <laughs> it is funny working at a water plant. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Drink my own coffee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, here you can see, uh, the, I wasn't sure what was on this map, uh, Dr. Menino, but um, up in the top, kind of top dead center, you can see we have the uh, that blue star. That's the water plant. Mm -hmm. um, most of the well fields are kind of just, gen for the brackish water facility, are kind of northeast of there. They run kind of along, uh, you know, LNR Industrial Boulevard. We have some wells and along some existing utility corridors uh, in that area. We've got a couple, those brown and uh, those brown colored lines that you can see there, those are uh, raw water lines. So mm -hmm. uh, you can see that's where our raw water comes from. And uh, once it goes to the plant, it goes, gets treated, meets all our federal primary and secondary drinking water standards. We demonstrate that affirmatively to our regulatory agencies through uh, testing and continuous monitoring. And then we send it off to the, to the customers. Uh, I think these numbers are uh, maybe a couple years old, but we've got about 10,000 connections overall, the vast majority of which are residential. We've got about 140-some miles of water main, mm -hmm. uh, and we've got 1,300-ish fire hydrants, 2,200 valves for controlling uh, you know, uh, the system if we ever had a line break or need to do repairs and all that sort of stuff. So that's how we get the water out to the customers. Um, we do want to touch a little bit on the wastewater utility. I know this is like a common question about, you know, like, and it's been a subject of discussion with the sustainability committee because we were working through the STAR framework and there were always great things about like how to improve your water quality. And mm -hmm. we've done a lot of those. So we wanted to kind of bring that back to you and say, and show that, hey, we've been working on this for a long time and that uh, we're doing really great on the wastewater side of things too. Um, Here's our wastewater collection system. Obviously, we start with water going out to the customers, and then they send it back to us once they use it. Um, so we've got 
you know, another 150 some miles of pipe to collect all that wastewater and take it back to a central location for treatment, like 2,300 manholes uh, for access to clean and maintain the system. Uh, we've got 60 uh, lift stations, which is when you've got a very flat area, you don't want your slope pipes to go wind up 60 feet underground as they keep getting deeper and deeper and deeper. So occasionally we have a pump, so we pump it back up and send it on its way to the plant if it's uh, most of the system is run by gravity, so it requires no energy to, to move the water around, and that's that's an important engineering thing that they try and do is conserve energy use by using gravity to move water around as much as possible. Yes, Dr. Mickey. So um, at the end of Chesapeake, hmm. there's a pump station, mm-hmm. and people are there, like, all the time working on it. Hmm. It's Riverside and Chesapeake. You know, right over the Yacht Club Bridge. Mm-hmm. I know what you're talking about, yeah. People are there all the time. Why are they there all the time? That's a good question. Um, I don't know the answer right off the top of my head. We've got 60 lift stations, and we do have some... I don't think we have any private lift stations up there, but we have three lift stations right there, one on Riverside and Chesapeake, and we've got another one off to the right as you come into that down Chesapeake, Undor. another one all the way back up by the mobile home community. Right. Um, I know where they all are. Okay. Uh, yeah, we have uh, a dedicated utilities maintenance crew. Mm-hmm. So sometimes they'll put different lift stations on priority for rehab. So they might be going in and rebuilding uh-huh. electrical panels or replacing pumps or doing pipe work. Uh, the life cycle on those lift stations usually tem- they tend to last somewhere between 30, 40, 50 years, depending on service and how they're originally constructed. So we have a dedicated staff that go around and they'll pick different lift stations to really focus on and rehab. And I think Chesapeake might have been on that list, uh, as I recall. Um, But we have a plan that we're kind of working through certain lift stations to get major rehabs on a scheduled basis. I know I had a call once because it was leaking and stuff like that. I walk my dog, you know, I walk my dog a lot, so I know where all these things are. (laughs) People tend to walk their dogs by those. <laughs> well, it's on the you know, you walk your dog, you know where things are. Uh, for for our operations folks, we appreciate it when pet owners don't curb their uh, dogs on our our pipes. Um, we never do that. <laughs> so um, dogs know better. I like to think so. <laughs> um, so yeah, so our waste so we we move all this wa- wastewater around, right? And we take it to our advanced wastewater treatment facility. It's called an advanced wastewater treatment facility because it provides nutrient removal. So this it fi- does what? It it does nutrient removal. So there's different standards in Florida uh, for what level of treatment you provide, and. Um, in 1986, there was lar- a lot of issues in the 80s with water quality in the Tampa Bay region. Uh, so they put out some new regulations called the Grizzle Fig Standards. They were named after certain uh, pr- prominent politicians that pushed this issue at the time. And uh, they made numeric nutrient criteria for the Tampa Bay region. So all the area utilities had to come up to these you know, stringent standards for nutrient removal. And that's when we built our advanced wastewater treatment facility. So our plant's built to handle 4 million gallons a day of wastewater treatment. Our flows tend to average about 2 million gallons a day. Uh, as the water goes out, the dish, you notice that's lower than um, what we produce. Uh, so some water, people use it, and it goes through sinks and showers and toilets and things like that, and it comes back. And other stuff, uh, not so much, you know, so like out, a little bit of outdoor water use. There's some like, uh, you know, consumptive uses and uh, things like that in like industrial activities and things like that. So, Tommy, yeah. what, what's the legality on um, someone creating, let's say, a gray water um, system on their property? That's a great question. I'm not super familiar with gray water. We tend to focus uh, in utilities. We tend to be heavily focused on um, everything up to the property line. So the utility owns all the utilities up to the property line or up to the water meter. And once we get into gray wa- internal gray water systems, that becomes mm-hmm. part of like the building code and things like that. Uh, so that's a little <laughs> bit of a different issue. I'm not, I'm not very well versed in that right now. Okay. Um, so when you say you remove nutrients, the word nutrients has like positive connotations. Mm. You know, you want to have nutrients. You want to eat nutrients. So yeah. What are these nutrients? Are they good things? What do you do with them? Lots of things need nutrients, including 
harmful algae. So uh, the reason that we do nutrient removal is to, at the end of the day, we've got all this, you know, these nutrients, right? And um, I don't know. What are the nutrients? So nutrients would be things like in, in the human body, they might be things like your vitamins and minerals and things like that. Okay. For plants, that might be things like nitrogen and phosphorus. Okay. Um, those are the most important ones we look at. We also look at all the other sort of organic material that um, could be consumed by microbes that might oh, need, yeah. they might need oxygen out of like ambient water sources to, uh, to basically consume all that energy. Uh, so basically the goal of the wastewater treatment process is to um, take all those things that could have harmful impacts on natural systems, like mm -hmm. say the Ancloat River, and treat them to a level that is um, acceptable for the natural environment. And so uh, we remove all, all the things, that are a lot, the vast majority of the compounds that like bacteria or microbes would eat that would consume oxygen out of the water column, for example. We uh, remove uh, the vast majority of all the nitrogen and phosphorus. That if how, you put how, a lot of nitrogen and phosphorus, how do you remove them, and where do they go once you remove them? Okay, um, so basically, the wastewater treatment process is a biological process. So uh, water treatment tends to be a chemical process. You're using chemistry to or physical processes like membranes and filters. Uh, the biological treatment process is there's microbes in wastewater, mm -hmm. right? We can all guess where they come from, and um, what we they want to consume all the organic matter and all the nutrients right. and chemical compounds in the wastewater, right? But there's not enough of them. Mm -hmm. So what we do is we basically add some oxygen, use some really smart chemistry and biological principles, and we convert all those chemicals and all those organic sources of energy into biomass. So we have the bugs and we grow them and then we get them used to eat consuming the wastewater compounds. And uh, we take and then we put them into what they call a clarifier. You can see those kind of circular uh, open air tanks in the back there. Mm -hmm. And then we settle them all down. They become, it's not the best term, but they become like a wastewater sludge. And it's just biomass. It's lots and lots and lots of microbes that like to eat the chemical compounds that are in wastewater. And then we take them back to the plant and they're, they've kind of gone to sleep and they've eaten all the food and they're all hungry. And we send them back to the front of the plant where there's lots and lots and lots of food for them to eat. And we give them as much oxygen as they need to consume all those uh organic compounds. So we're basically taking all this chemical energy and organic compounds and nitrogen and phosphorus and turning it into microbe bodies. And then we take all the water off the top through the clarifier system, yeah. send that off uh, to get disinfected and filtered and turn into reclaimed water. And then we take all the biomass and we concentrate it, take all the rest of the water out, and um, that becomes biosolids. Uh, you might have heard of that, and that goes for beneficial reuse in agricultural pr uh, practices. Oh, really? Yeah, so, yeah, it gets, so human waste gets used yeah. after, into agriculture. Well, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. So what we, happens to all of the pharmaceuticals that are in people's waste, and how does that all get processed? They, uh, they don't go away, unfortunately. They don't. Well, some some organic compounds are broken down. We we don't do a lot of like super stringent testing on a weekly, on a daily or monthly basis for like those types of compounds, um, but we do do a screening uh, once a year for all the different mm -hmm. uh, primary and secondary drinking water standards uh, to make sure that we're not doing anything that's like harmful for the environment and stuff like that. And these bugs that eat this stuff mm -hmm. are they like visible bugs or are they microscopic microscopic bugs? typically oh, okay. you, you can see them in in aggregate like yeah they'll clump together and form little like brown floaty specks that are floating around kind of like uh if you ever had a, has, has anyone here ever had a fish tank mm -hmm. yeah yeah and you have your little filter mm -hmm. that's doing the same thing so on your filter you get all that little brown slimy stuff growing on there yeah. and that's similar to the wastewater process those those uh, things that grow on your filter are converting all the ammonia from your fish tank into other compounds. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're doing the same thing, but instead of using a physical media where the bugs are growing on a filter, we've got them suspended in the water and they're going around inside the water column eating all the different chemicals. Good analogy to fish yeah. tank. Thank you. It's very good. Mm -hmm. Like Pac-Man. It's, it is very much like Pac-Man. We actually do once a week look at them under a microscope and see what types of bugs are in there. And there's certain types of bugs that you want. And if, you know, you get too much of like the wrong kind of bugs, you go and adjust the process. And yeah, so they, we do look at that. Um, yeah. Fascinating. And, yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, and the good news is, is we have a five-stage biological remo uh, removal process. We use microbiology to do all this treatment. 
and for these uh, compounds that would be harmful to the natural environment. And um, the goal is that when we do need to discharge water out to the Antelope River, when we have a little bit too much and we don't have enough reclaimed water customers to use it, uh, that we're being protective of the natural environment. And in most cases, the water that we discharge to the Antelope River mm -hmm is uh, lower in nutrients uh, than the water that's in the river where we're discharging into. So we're actually, you know, it's not like we're doing, you know, the river a favor, but we're definitely not having negative impacts uh, in a meaningful way. But the river and the Anclote is brackish, isn't it? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so which brings us to our reclaimed water system. So we're, mm -hmm. we, one of our parts of uh, becoming more sustainable, dealing with our water resources issues as part of the region, uh, the water management district had a goal for regionally to, for everyone to get to 75% reuse of their treated wastewater. And uh, we're, we tend to hover around 80, depending on the climate for the year. Uh, so we're reusing 80% of our reclaimed water. Um, and uh, we've, over time, built out a very extensive reclaimed water system. Uh, you can see here, those are, all those purple lines are where we have re, uh, reclaimed water service. Uh, we've got about 1,800 customers right now. Uh, and our average customer uses, as a resident, uses about 500 gallons a day. And we've also got several storage tanks to help store up the water when we have it and to maximize our use. And we've got about 30 miles of water mains. Yes? Okay. So on Chesapeake, where I live, uh -huh. you can see, it's that little peninsula, right? There's no reclaimed water. Mm -hmm. And the city just put grass in, right, in that little park towards the mobile home thing in the back. Where is mm -hmm. it? Right here. This is Chesapeake, okay. this little peninsula. Okay. And so um, they irrigate it all the time. Mm -hmm. So they must be using potable water because I think it's too, probably too shallow at that end to have a well. Most likely. So they're using the city just put in that grass unnecessarily mm -hmm. and are using potable water to irrigate it so uh, you know don't make me happy um, and if there was reclaimed water that would be another issue so I guess using my street as an example my little peninsula um, when are you going to extend reclaimed water further because I don't think we're Robin lives. There's there's not reclaimed water from what I can see. I don't know about you. That's our most common question probably uh, that we get in the wastewater division is when am I going to get reclaimed water at my house? Um, at this point, so there, uh, an important part about reclaimed water is that uh, in any particular municipality, it's generally unlikely that, the, that all of the, com the customers can have reclaim water, and it's just because of availability. So uh, if you look at the average uh, house in Florida, it, use it, it, it only produces about a third as much wastewater as it needs to supply its irrigation needs. So in any particular municipality, most uh, only about a third of the customers are going to be able to have reclaim water uh, access because that's how much wastewater is produced by that population. Prioritize some residents and not others because and i know they have to pay for it right? sure that was done uh it, it was a that was well before my tenure here but there was we had a reclaim water master plan that we co-funded with the water management district and the goal of the master plan is to identify you know how can we maximize the utilization of reclaim water uh in a cost effective way and so the goal was to you know most utilities make the decision to try and hook up if there's a handful of like large volume water users that you can only spend a limited amount of capital dollars, uh, they tend to hook up folks that have the most impact first. So like things like golf courses, city ball fields, city park space, cemeteries, things like that. And all all of those in our cities have uh, reclaimed hmm. water. And you know the golf course has reclaimed water. The cemetery uses reclaimed water. The ball fields use, use reclaimed water. Mm -hmm. And then as you build out those pipelines, to those large users, you're able to provide reclaimed water along those corridors. So uh, we we had a master plan. We built out the master plan. The master plan is complete. We've done it, and uh, we kind of have our system now. And unfortunately, that's what I was getting to with this uh, slide because this is a very common question: is you know what we're at 80% reuse. Everyone feels like that's a lot of folks feel like that 
there's another 20% that's sort of hanging out that we could use. But you can see here, this is from 2020. Mm -hmm. And um, we're 80% reuse over the course of the year, but we have a large change uh, seasonally as we go month to month. So you can see when we get into March, April, May, we have almost no water going out the enclote. And in many, and in some cases in recent years since then, we've gone weeks and weeks and weeks in a row where every single drop that we produce goes in the tank and is consumed by our customers for an extended period of time to where we're having to do reclaimed outage days uh, to help to manage our supply because we physically don't have enough water coming in the plant to meet all our existing customers. And so um, we did do an evaluation to see what it would, if it would be practicable to, uh, extend reclaimed water north of the river, for example, or to do some additional large storage projects to help us get much above 80%. Uh, we've got a couple more smaller reclaimed water projects that are sort of legacy that are going to be coming online uh, over the next year or so. Um, but that's kind of our build out for the reclaimed water system. And because it's low we, in those months because there's the snowbirds leave? Uh, the, the way I like to think about it is the customers get the water first and the leftovers is what we have to discharge the river. So mm -hmm. we have our tanks and when they're, you know, and when they fill up all the way to the top and there's nowhere to put it and no one's using it, uh, that's when we have to do a surface water discharge. And you can see in uh, March, April, May, if those are the dry months, right? Sometimes into June. I see. That's I when everyone's it. irrigating a lot. They need mm -hmm. the water. Everyone's trying to keep their grass alive. We're trying to keep the golf course nice and the ball fields looking good for the, for the little league kids and stuff like that. Um, and the vast majority of our water availability is in the wet months when no one really wants it. So no one really wants to irrigate the ball fields. We don't need to irrigate the golf course as much when it's September and it's raining every day. And uh, there's just very little demand for, for reclaimed as a product. So the only way to do to get much above 80%, you start to run into very costly projects. You're in a, like diminishing returns where you're investing millions and millions of dollars to get that next 2 or 3 or 4% reclaimed use. So it seems to me given how precious water is and how it's going to even get more precious, mm -hmm. that it would behoove the city to think about, for example, I keep going back to this park in, in, on Chesapeake. There's no reason for them to have planted grass there. Mm -hmm. it, we didn't need it. You could have planted, you know, mm -hmm. ground cover or you could have made some interesting thing. Because you put the grass in, I mean, when it's tall, it gets really tall quickly, because mm -hmm. it's that kind of grass, so they have to mow it like all the time. And it's really all full of weeds because I walk my dog. Um, but, so now we have grass mm -hmm. and we have to irrigate it. We weren't, nothing was being irrigated before. Sure, it was sand and there were weeds, but I'll tell you, no one really cared mm -hmm. um, that it was like that because, one, it's not a park that people use. No, it has one bench in it. No one uses it. And, um, and it's, it's sort of unnecessary. Sure. Sure, it, you know, everybody's brought up to, like, ga grass, mm -hmm. you know, but I think we have to be thinking very differently about how we use our water and why we have to mow all the time. I think it's uh, going to have to be a topic for future future discussion, but I think that a as, a, well, as the sustainability plan is mm -hmm. uh, rolled out, you know, year by year, month by month, hopefully there'll be more coordination. Mm -hmm. that, that might have been a decision that was made prior to... No, it wasn't. Uh, um, it was made by the person yeah. whose park it is. Yeah, and I know that uh, Florida-friendly landscapes are definitely a part of the discussion that mm -hmm. we're all having considering mm -hmm. um, the drought that we've been in. You mm -hmm. know, we have to have more plants yeah. that are just tolerant of drought, mm -hmm. and hopefully this is an anomaly year, but um, I don't, think, I don't so. think so either, unfortunately. Yeah. But we do have an agenda, that yeah. the time that we have to stick to at this point. So we'll have to look at that yes. and figure that out um, in the future. Thank you. 
Um, yeah, so that that's a little bit of an overview of like, you know, what our reclaimed water situation looks like. So, you know, just uh, in summary, you know, we're using as much as we possibly can. Uh, you know, we've got a little bit of opportunities for build, finishing building out our existing projects, but uh, long term, we've sort of built the system and we've become quite efficient. We're dramatically, well, not dramatically, but we are exceeding the Water Management District's regional target for us, which is 75% reuse, and we're up around 80. So we're doing quite good, and we've been very progressive on reclaimed water development to the maximum extent that we could really like financially support. Um, so yeah, in summary, we've got a few major successful programs that really tie in with sustainability. And like building out the reclaimed water system. That was a 20 year endeavor, uh, if not a little bit more. Uh, completing our own independent alternative water supply to reduce our water supply burden on the regional system uh, and building out our solar projects uh, at the reverse osmosis plant, which we'll talk about in just a minute. And this is a really cool thing. We're part of a big regional success here. So we weren't doing this in a vacuum. Uh, this was part of us working in conjunction with the Water Management District, all these other regional utilities to help make a difference uh, in our water supply and for the environment. So this is a really cool graph. Um, in uh, March of 2021, mm -hmm. Swiftman announced that the regional recovery strategy for Northern Tampa Bay was complete. <laughs> they met all their goals, the water resources were recovering, and they dramatically reduced the amount of fresh water being taken out of the upper Florida aquifer. And you can see those bar charts are the amount of total water production out of the upper Florida aquifer, and they've hit their targets. Uh, in many cases, they've, in some year, if you look at it from certain peak years, they've almost cut regional groundwater use in half. Mm -hmm. And that orange line is our population. So we're serving more and more and more people with less and less and less dependence on our uh, limited fresh groundwater resources. And you can see here our per capita water use. Uh, you know, Florida's average per capita water use is about 134. The US average is about 130. Uh, in the regional, in the water management district, we're about 97. And Tarpon, we're actually lower than that. We tend to be in the low 90s, depending on what year it is. So we're doing quite exceptional on conservation. Um, and this has really good implications for natural resources. So here's those water resources that we were looking at earlier. There you can see. Uh, 13 years later, we had a dry lake, now it's a lake again. Mm -hmm. And in fall 2021, that creek was, Cypress Creek location was not looking particularly much like a creek. And, you know, 15 years later, it's a functional, you know, habitat and a functional water resource again. So what's the, what are those white things in the river? Uh, I'm afraid I couldn't tell you. It looks like it's a little bit of foam. You sometimes get that if you get like you know, some, uh, we have very tannic waters here, so then you get that if you have like a little rapid or something like that. Okay, it looks like soap suds or something. I, I didn't take that photo. That's from, that's from 2016, so uh, I would hope that they would Ice take a flows. photo of a good natural system. <laughs> so uh, that's all we have on the water supply. In a minute, we'll talk about the solar system. Uh, these, thank you. Thank you. Well thank you very much. It's so interesting. Cool. Uh, any additional so questions important. before we move on to solar? I think. Yeah. All right. That's good. Okay. All right. And here's uh, Daryl Vasi again to talk about our RO plants uh, solar generation system. Mm. Okay. Very excited to talk about the project that we have going on at the, uh, at the RO plant uh, with solar power. So what are the benefits? Why, why are we investing in solar power? Well, I talked earlier about the, uh, um, the amount of pressure that it takes from them. We are, we are a very energy intensive process. So one, it saves a lot of energy costs to be able to use solar. Um, it, uh, it, and ultimately that's going to have a positive effect on all the people that are buying water uh, if we can lower our costs. And, and obviously is a, just as importantly, I mean, the city has goals for sustainability um, you know, meeting environmental objectives, and, and this contributes to that as well. So I talk, early talked about you know, the second, but why, why solar? You know, and not, not only uh, does it help reduce bills, but, um, you know, we're kind of at the whim, just like we are as residents, to Duke Energy, right, uh, raising rates. And um, we had a huge rate increase this year, and I'll, you'll see that in a second on a slide I have. Uh, right here. So you, this is kind of a, a neat graphic that shows, you know, what's what's the contribution of electricity to the, the the cost of water that we buy. So we 
distribute, you know, you pay your bills in dollars per 1,000 gallons, right? Um, you can see uh, where we were about 66 cents, uh, excuse me, 68 cents, 69 cents back in, uh, in uh, early 2019. And you can see right when the solar project went in, uh, phase one, uh, dropped our, you know, the contribution of that down to 57 cents. So pretty dramatic uh, decrease percentage-wise. And I, I carried this out to the most recent billing, and you can see in 2023, uh, that's, that's not more water that caused that huge increase in cost. That's the rate increase that we got from Duke. So, um, you know, it's up now at, at 92 cents. So it's... Uh, it's just like everything that that we see. Um, we see it as consumers. We see it certainly at, at the utility. I mean, chemical costs go up. Electrics, elect, uh, the cost of electricity goes up, and there's not a whole lot. You know, we kind of have to take it. So, what can we do? We can. They switch their sources too. They're not you you getting electricity from oil. They're doing it from natural gas mm -hmm. now right. because we spent a long time on the phone with them last week because of our rate increase. Oh, sure. Yeah, and we were looking at our bill, and we were this didn't make sense. But we 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 got a little a mini tutorial uh, in a personalized way. But that that was one of the reasons, and it's cleaner energy. Yeah. Right, but it is more costly. It yeah. used to be cheaper, but now it isn't. Yeah. So we, uh, we're, we're actually, the pro uh, project we have underway now is what we'll call phase two, but we, we have quite a few solar panels installed, and that's that blue box at the top. That's what we'll call phase one. That consists of 416 solar panels. They're all 390-watt modules, so each panel, and they're, I don't have an exact, they're probably three foot by five foot as a typical module, and they, they put out uh, 390 watts, so the whole system has 120 watt, uh, 120 kilowatt capacity. Now we talk, it actually makes energy in DC and it converts it to AC. So I'm just going to talk AC because that's what we we use um, as a consumer. So 120 kilowatt system. Phase two is all the things you see in green. Mm -hmm. So um, LNR on the very left of that picture is LNR Industrial Parkway. There's a, a, going to be an array of, of panels right out at the road. Uh, and then the rest, you'll see one at the top right. Uh, there's, there's like a, a, a small area. We're, we, we are basically taking every square foot we can and putting solar in there. You'll see that um, th there's a couple at the, at the, um, at the bottom right. That would be the... Um, that would be the uh, southeast corner of the property. There's a couple panels there. Right in, the, in that thing that separates them, there's a well right in the middle of that. That's one of the wells where we're pulling brackish water. Hmm. That green space to the left of that is like a wetlands area. It's the, it's the, it's the um, you know, retention pond for, for, uh, um, for storm water. So that's kind of an untouchable area. And obviously we're right up against the fire station there. So How many kilowatts does the RO plant use per day? Um, oh, I pulled all this, all this data. Um, I, I, don't, I don't have a number off the top. I don't have a good number. I can get back. I can get that I'm number. I'm just curious, you know. So, so this solar, the, the, even, so I didn't finish phase two. It's 663 panels. And you'll notice that the modules now, it is solar is, uh, the technology is improving. We've gone from 390 watt modules. Now they're up to 450. That will continue to grow, you know, as as time goes on. So you know they'll be more and more efficient for the same size module. Uh, and so this will give us 235 kilowatts. So we're producing right now. The solar phase one produces. What would you say, Tommy? Less than less than 10 percent of our total power. We we did a quick uh, assessment on this. Um, we found that, you know, obviously, depending on what time you're using power and things like that, um, there are certain times during the day if we're not producing, you know, through the skids, like we can approach, you know, almost all of the mm. daytime electrical consumption. But we also tend to produce a lot of our water at night because electricity is cheaper and we're trying to keep costs down. And so... Uh, all in, we're th we, we estimate that depending on the year and, like, climate conditions and whatnot, that the 
Uh, first phase is producing 4 or 5% of our total energy demands for the RO plant. And the um, when we implement phase two, it'll be eh, somewhere in that 13, 14, 15% range. Yeah, so not a direct answer to your question, uh, but Basically but you get a few. We're, we're using, a, yeah, we're, we're okay. yeah. Be, be, be. So you have to have a lot of solar panels to, f to completely... Yes. Yeah, we're not, we have to, tie, we're tied into the grid, but right. we're not sending anything to the grid. It's all being consumed. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, I, I'm curious, and probably you might get asked this a lot as well. Why are there no solar panels on any of those rooftops? Is it a different type of solar panel for industrial, or is it? That's a great question. So we, we've talked about, you know, what's phase three, because we have the ability to, to add more, uh, they've talked about on top of that, that large round tank is the water distribution tank, but that tank is very special, and I, there's not a lot of appetite to mount anything up there. The risk is just too high. So now you get into the building, and, you know, we really need to take, you know, it really wasn't designed for solar panels, the weight of it. Um, so we really need to take a look at you know, you, you got to get into the cost benefit. How many panels can you put up there? And if you have to reinforce the structure, is, is it is it going to pay off? Um, All those questions. Yeah. Is, is the city looking at any chance to to purchase property just for solar fields? You know, like I don't know. Adjacent yeah. to there or nearby? Or? Uh, we we haven't um, done any evaluations that I'm aware of as far as like tr property acquisition solely for solar. Um, we do have an action item in the sustainability plan about doing feasibility study for uh, solar at city facilities. I, I want to say that's in year two. Yeah. Uh, Jordan, your call. It it's not year one. It's I think not year one. I think it's year two or three that to look. Yeah. Year one, I think we we're trying to be we're going to be working on like a clean energy target mm -hmm. and a plan, and then a follow up to that will be assessing city facilities for op for opportunities for um, for solar on site. Uh, one of the findings that we kind of leaned into a little bit in the greenhouse gas study was that uh, we, we did our inventory and we kind of quickly were able to come to, you know, all right, there's not enough like vacant land near like on site with these facilities so that future offsets for um, uh, or replacements for grid energy would likely have to be some sort of off site facility or alternately working through our existing program uh, by not directly building those facilities ourselves, but participating in that Duke CEC program to help them produce offsite solar and we kind of pay into it with them. Gotcha, mm -hmm. thank you. Okay, um, so we, we um, are currently building out phase two of our uh, solar project. The, the, the areas I showed you on the uh, on the previous slide, so right now they're putting the the columns, or they call it pile driving. They've uh, they st I, I wrote this last week, so it started this week. Actually, started last week, um, and uh, we've got completion slated for the month of November. So all the solar panels are on site. Actually, that area that's right off of Ellendar Parkway. If you were to drive down there today, they have panels on all that now. Um, now it's not it's not wired up, so don't get too excited, you know. But uh, Driven or whatever, and, yep, yep, and it was yeah. So they've got those panels up. So uh, yeah, we're we're it, it, they've had a crew out there. They're bringing a second crew. They said late this week. I, my guess is it'll be early next week. So we'll really accelerate uh, the project who, along. Who's putting it in? Uh, we have a company, um, Advanced Roofing, is their formal name. Doing they're doing Advanced Green Technologies (AGT). Um, they're out of Fort Lauderdale. Um, you know, they've they, uh, done a nice job. So the, the picture at the bottom is just the panel uh, that's in our lobby. So when you walk in, you see, how are we doing today on solar? And I <laughs> happened to snap this. I, should, I thought later, I had to get the slides in last week, but I thought I should have snapped the photo when it was at 120 kilowatt output. You know, that would have been, uh, but I just took it and... Uh, but there's, uh, but there's a neat little thing you can see on the right side. It says how many pounds of CO2. So there's all sorts of little things that you touch at the bottom, and it'll tell you 
um, you know, what impact, how many gallons of gas did you save or how many, you know, barrels of oil or whatever. So, um, Uh, s some pictures I, I snapped, just the, the southeast property corner. You can see that one. When I took it, uh, they hadn't uh, started the pile driving. It's You can see all those uh, stakes with the little flags on them. That's where they're going. Top right is our phase one, just kind of a look down the line. You, it's hard to get all the panels in a picture, but that's the north property line. The bottom right picture is the front of the building. Like I said, that uh, shows just the... Uh, uh, the piles in there, and, and they started. They were just starting to spread the, you know, the cloth to prevent weeds from coming up. Right. And um, yeah, today it's all that that cloth's all covered with stone, and there's all panels on there now. It looks really cool. Mm -hmm. And then we have a small set at the northeast uh, corner of the property. That's the bottom left picture. That's that's uh, going in front of the uh, of the current panels. Mm -hmm. So, kind of exciting. Very exciting. All right. Well, thank you so much. Yeah. yeah. Terrific. Terrific. All right. There's a lot to celebrate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think that we're on track with um, quite a quite a few sustainability projects already, even even before the committee came together. Yeah. You know, so this is wonderful news, and we really appreciate. Um, the explanation, I think, next to trees, water is, a, is a, one of the most exciting topics, and it's mm -hmm. vital. We, we get a lot of questions it. about that, that for we sure. We keep looking at it, <laughs> and we keep looking at conservation efforts. Mm -hmm. um, now for a very exciting part of this evening's meeting, um, I'm going <laughs> to ask for, we have a sustainability coordinator to celebrate. Yay! And we would on, love to get a little background. So Tommy is going to introduce Jordan. Yeah, so it's my very distinct pleasure to introduce uh, Ms. Jordan Wilcox. She's going to be our new sustainability coordinator. Uh, as we talked last meeting, we were very close to making a hire. She was selected out of over 50 applicants on a nationwide search. Uh, she comes to us via, she's, she's local right here uh, in, in um, uh, pass, just up the road in Pasco County, and she comes to us via Colorado, and before that, uh, the city of Cincinnati, and uh, we're very excited to have her. Yay. Yay. Awesome. Hi. So I just want to take this time. I'm sure, I don't know if you guys have any questions or anything like that. Um, most of my experience, I graduated from the University of Cincinnati um, with a degree um, mostly focusing on environmental policy, actually. Um, that was a goal to maybe pursue environmental law, actually, environmental justice. Um, and I didn't want to go to school for another six years. I really wanted to get out there. Um, and I was, I was, I was a little burnt out at that point, but, um, d had a great internship with the stormwater management utility, um, with the city of Cincinnati. They actually, uh, created a full-time position for me, um, after my internship. So I literally graduated like December 7th and that next, that next week I started full-time, um, and it was a, it was a great experience. Um, stormwater management was under the waterworks umbrella. So different, um, challenges for sure up in Ohio versus what we're dealing with and seeing here. Um, but obviously water, we, no one survives without, you know, excellent, excellent water. So, um, and even there, it's probably going to become an issue and not, not the not too distant future. Um, and then, um, after I, I left about, January of 2022, moved out to Colorado for about a year. Um, Where in Colorado? I was on the front range. So um, you're kind of right on, when you have 25 going up the front range of the Rockies, you have uh, you have the, the prairies, you know, right. to the east and the west, you have the Rockies. And it's just the recreation is amazing. The conservation programs out there are just like unimaginable. Um, the public land access it's 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 earth shattering to come from the midwest and and go out there and and experience that so that was um personally very incredible for me and then um moved here to be closer to family my family's mostly down in Bradenton um hmm. and my parents are here a cousin and my grandparents are snowbirds so I have a, a good bit of my family down here too so uh, I decided to stay and uh have loved the decision ever since, especially since uh, coming on to this position. This is kind of the, we talked in the interview about it a lot, actually the interviews about it a lot, but something like this for um, an environmental student 
this is what you go in for. Like this is seeing the difference that you make in your local community. I mean, this is, this is the purpose of it. You know, like this is where you see all of your hard work culminating and the way you can serve your community. And you see that, you know, reclaimed water has made such a huge impact and it's part of the the success that you guys are seeing now. And you guys have done an amazing job with the um, sustainable sustainability plan. And Mm -hmm. Robin has done an amazing job up to this point. And I am an action oriented person. So I am ready to kind of take this and run with it and have an amazing, you know, group of us ready to go. So, and really get, get off to a good start. So do you have any specific goals that special goals to you that you (laughs) We gave her a long list of goals. <laughs> I do have I do have a long list of goals. I have a couple of um, I personal ideas yeah. that I would really love to see um, come to fruition um, that are related to the to the plan, but not necessarily super directly. So I would love to to talk with you all about those and at some point and you know get to get to going with those. Can you tell us one or two? I don't. I don't know. I'm, this is my, I've never had a committee that is live streamed and then available to the public. So I don't know. That's fine. You okay. Can, you can talk about things that might be important to you for a sustainability uh, initiative. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, um, I love, <laughs> I love that the facility is even available. I don't know if it's even feasible, but the, um, the ability to better utilize our, um, maybe our yard waste facility. Mm. Um, and so I, 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 we drove by it and I was like, and then I found out it was 55 acres and, you know, and obviously we don't need that much space, but, um, it seems like we are missing, you know, and it's on the system. Energy production? Energy production, uh, composting facility. We were out today for, I mean, the ideas are just churning to make that. Right. make that work better for us. But we were out today actually learning about living shorelines out at, um, Felipe park mm-hmm. and just, they, you know, um, they use bags of oyster shells mm-hmm. and those are reclaimed, which is amazing. Um, and they basically like, they're just turned regularly and left out in the sun and that's all that you need to like cure them, if you will. Um, and then they're rebuilding shorelines with that. And it's just, um, could we do that, a program like that at our facility and utilize, we're so close to the coast, you know, that's going to be a huge uh, like option to, um, to continue to build up our, our, our shoreline options. You know, we have, um, a lot of coastline here, so Mm -hmm. it's something we definitely need to protect and, um, just different things like that. So, you know, the, the yard waste facility, I don't want to make any, any promises or any assumptions. I'm still so new. Um, I don't want to step on toes either, you know, of, of other city departments and, um, and other projects that may be in the works, but I, I see that and I just see a lot of potential and it could really work for the community. So that's what I'm thinking initially, but you have to understand this is my second Thursday here. So (laughs) really, really fresh, uh, fresh out. So, so yeah. Do you have any more questions? Can I answer anything? I'm sure we'll get to know each other very well. So um, my door is, my cubicle door is always open to you all. Um, Feel free to always pick up the phone, give me a shout, send me an email. I love ideas. And a lot of times I think that uh, collaboration is the way to go. You know, like you guys are here, you live here, you know, this is your community. Mm -hmm. And that is, you know, I, I'm quickly falling in love with it, but I, you know, I don't, I don't live here at this point. So you guys are the ones in the trenches, if you will. So but you'll I, be running the meetings, right? You'll I will. Be, yes. Oh, and I'll be here. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Oh yeah. He's, <laughs> I think he's ready for me to take back over so that he can get back to everything he needs to do. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, our plan moving forward. Um, yeah, we did, uh, we've, we set up a little bit of a transition plan. Uh, it, honestly, yeah, we talked about this a bit, but you know, the, the timing, you know, it's, it's unfortunate that Robin, uh, moved on, uh, you know, uh, she was dedicated to the city for sur- uh, for sure. But, um, as far as timing goes, it, it was not the worst time to have, it was a little bit of a natural break in the program. Mm-hmm. And so we've been focused on making the plan and we've already been talking to Miss Jordan, uh, extensively about digging in the plan, looking at all the work that we've already established and um, making and jumping straight into implementation and making a plan for that, for how to start tackling these action items and uh, getting her feet wet uh, with, you know, all the different city departments and things like that. So we've got a, 
a lot of uh, things that we're going to be working on for the next couple months to get uh, Miss Wilcox up to speed. And um, uh, we're, we're really excited to have her. She's brought a lot of energy to the position already. That's great. Yes, so you. I'm I'm ready for it. So yeah. yes, welcome, yeah. welcome, thank welcome. Thank you. We're thank very you. excited. Can't wait to meet the rest of everybody. Yes. <laughs> Dory said Dory was at a meeting in Savannah about mm. you know grants for um, ca electric cars and all of that, and she said Robin was there. Oh, Robin, uh, Robin yeah. Reeves was there. Robin oh, Reeves. Ro oh, Robin's at the same conference? Oh, that's, oh, that's yeah. funny. Yeah. It's a small world. It is. It is a small world. Okay, we're at items for the next meeting's agenda. Any thoughts on that? One thing that's been kind of burning within me since we finished the plan is really trying to figure out the best way of introducing um, the public Mm -hmm. to um, the sustainability plan and public engagement in general. I mean, the city can be doing everything it can to be sustainable, but I feel that unless we start to evolve the thought of everyday citizens as to what each of us can do in our small world to connect with the larger a group of people who are conscious about the environment, conscious about sustainability, sure. conscious about conservation, you know, all of the all of the factors that are within our control. If we if we can figure that piece out, I think that we'll be you know ahead of the game. Mm -hmm. I agree. I had a and this is this is I don't even think I've mentioned this to Tommy either, but I had a I, I've kind of been tracking a little bit that with that locally just to, to update people about what we're doing. You know, like this was the, the sustainable plan was sustainability plan was an endeavor. You know, I mean, it's, you know, almost a hundred page document detailing what we hope to do. And so I was wondering if there's not a good like engagement session, if we need to have like, um, I, I'm really in the brainstorming bit here, but just like a public engagement session, like biannually, uh, like just to update everybody, but make it fun, make it interesting, maybe even make it like, um, you know, just, just something that they come to and they're, it's not just a, a meeting or it's not just like a town hall presentation, but something they can engage in with mm -hmm. an activity of some sort, make it friendly for, for kids. Cause I, 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 I very strongly believe in, um, engaging children in, mm -hmm. in, the, in these activities. I mean, that, they're who we're doing this for yeah. in all reality, but also who are going to step into our shoes at mm -hmm. some point. So um, that's just something that is sure. kind of, and we can, talk, we can talk about that, but I, I am on the same page with you and mm -hmm. would love to see something come of that as far as, yes, a formal update, but also like an engagement session mm -hmm. to make it fun. Like yeah. it's, it, we, we saw a lot of numbers today and like it's great mm -hmm. and we need those and we need to know how we're doing but you know we need to make it fun for the average person too I don't know I enjoyed it I don't know if everybody would and you know so. yes I, immediately what I thought of when you said engagement was engaging with the kids yeah like this we have our you know three middle or three elementaries middle school high school okay. St. Pete College St. Pete College actually has an environmental club, I think, that just started up. Oh, cool. But to see if there are, you know, science classes or even, um, what That's is that? Idea. What is that thing where people go and, and talk to the. Well, I think we're getting a little bit into the details. I do got to yeah. yeah. referee a little bit here. Yeah. That yeah. We want to make sure that Dory and the other committee members have to weigh in yeah, yeah. too. So let's, right. uh, I think this is a good topic. Let's, uh, let's definitely agenda. bring this back yeah, for the yeah, next absolutely. agenda, certainly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I also think that if we can't do anything this time about the yard waste mm -hmm. and the bags that the commission is voting on, that that should be on the agenda for next time so mm. we can make a recommendation to the commissioners. Mm -hmm. Did you get past the second reading? I thought it was, they were sending it, in the paper it said they were asking the city manager to review it and it wouldn't be till December or something? They're phasing it in. It, it is, um, it's not going to be like flipping a switch and having it done. They're phasing it in over time and Tom Funchen talked about the reasons behind that. 
It made a lot of sense. I can't recall what they were right But I now. thought the mayor asked for it to be not happen and for the city manager to look into it again. I think it's goal. I think it, it passed. I, oh, yeah? Um, yep. Um, I, I spoke. Are we going on to committee comments or staff no, comments? No, things about it. We're the looking agenda. at the agenda for next month. Yeah. Do you have... I think um, we could definitely... Um, yeah, that, that's a city policy, so it, it would be a little bit ahead of ourselves to start talking about it in detail now. Um, we can certainly um, bring that back if it's still timely. Would you like us to kind of, if, if the ordinances are, I, I understand that the, the committee has a desire to have some sort of feedback to the board, right? Well, like I potentially. Done, I, would. I think it's uh, in the paper, it didn't sound like it was done. Uh, what but I can do is can I can we, follow up. Can we yeah. have a report on it next time? Yes, we can have we can bring something back on that, uh, mm -hmm. and we'll and maybe we can talk to with Denise and if it's sort of already like established and yeah. voted on, you know, maybe we could save that topic for like you know for something you know more current. Would that be the the will of the committee or would? Mm -hmm. well, there were some questions at the first meeting about it. There was a little bit of pushback at the first reading. At the second reading, Tom Pungeon brought all the different types of containers and things mm. that you could put that yard waste in and really dispelled any, any huh. you can use your open big garbage right. cans or the whatever. Which There's we do. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, they, they actually bought 40,000 paper bags right. to distribute. It said that in the residents. paper. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's done, but oh. we'll, we'll find out. Yeah, it, it said I, in the paper the mayor was asking the city manager to look into it again. So it'd be good to know. Yeah what the deal is. I'll, I'll provide an update on that as soon as possible, especially if it's timely. Okay. And um, if it's, I also want to point out that, you know, the time, depending on how the meetings land, it might not be possible for y'all to take some sort of vote or uh, mm -hmm. uh, on that topic. But everyone here is a citizen. And if, mm -hmm. and there's nothing to preclude anybody uh, once we provide an update from uh, providing correspondence as individuals to the, um, to the board or the city manager or the mayor as well. I would like to have on the agenda that um, to hear more from Jordan about that's how you're going to, how you're approaching it, what your priorities are, what you're going to do first, what vision you have given everything you've learned from Tommy. Sure. It's only been a week. Which will be, <laughs> um, Which will be a long process, but <laughs> I, I would happily give you if it's if it if it makes it, I will happily give you guys more of a detailed update of um pre actually make a preparation that was obviously yeah. very informal. But if if that's what you guys would like, I would happily make um something a little more formal as far as referencing referencing the the plan and that sort of thing, and, and just give you an idea of like maybe how I. How yeah. my brain is processing. So we everything. get to yeah. know you better. Yeah, so, yeah, absolutely. I would think that would be really helpful. Yeah, Robin. Not, I mean, this is yard waste. We're circling back to the yard waste. <laughs> I have the agenda from that night. It's the ordinance twenty twenty three dash twenty yard waste collection procedures and fees second reading. So if it was the second reading for the ordinance, I think it's done because I mm -hmm. I got up and mm. and said. I said that I'm here not on not representing the sustainability committee, but I am a member and I can speak on their behalf because this is exactly what we're talking about mm -hmm. doing. Tom Funchen saw this where he could make an improvement, took it to the city manager, mm -hmm. moved forward with it. It's an environmentally sustainable initiative. It saves money and and, and right. it puts outreach, educational outreach to the community. So if it's not done, I congratulated them for nothing for the <laughs> for <those laughs> sounds well, like it's be done. Yeah. I, it's I guess the issue was that they can't put it in plastic bags anymore, mm -hmm. and that that's the thing the mayor said he wasn't sure that that should be implica implemented because people are used to doing it. That's and done. It's, it's yeah. Well, we just that's been put just want to well, make changes sure. are underway all the time, mm -hmm. and yeah. we're better be prepared. And I, I agree 100%. I think that what we've been waiting for in the interim is to really see the vision of mm -hmm. how the sustainability plan will launch mm -hmm. and um, the first steps of implementation and how we can best support your efforts. And, sure. yes. and, right. um, 
absolutely. I would, I would expediting, love that. Mm -hmm. you know, all the processes. Yeah, yes. absolutely. We were definitely anticipating bringing that as an item, like relatively soon, either October or November, as far as like what our plan is for like implementation phase. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll, we'll, we'll probably try and bring you like a minor update with like maybe like a, I do want to give Jordan some time to get her hands around like the whole city org structure and <laughs> things like that. Because a lot of the action items for year one are uh, through, will require quite a bit of collaboration with other departments. Mm -hmm. So um, she might need some time to like go and work with uh, like other departments and get to know their timelines for like ordinances and the comp plan and like opening the LDRs and things. Okay. The whole story in October. Sure. We just want the beginning first chapter what I see yeah like, yes. what I see and how I see a path forward yes I, I yes I can I, I have no problem doing that so yeah. I, okay I don't feel that that's, yeah, um, that's good too yeah. soon or anything yes and knowing that that's going to be evolving as you learn and yes. get connected with different departments and all yes. that that whole thing is kind of moving yes right now yeah and it's and it's you know it's a lot of moving parts and it's yeah. it's it's really mm -hmm. just um like Tommy said I I'm I kind of our goal for at least the next couple of weeks is going to be as his schedule allows, kind of introductions to everybody mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. within the city, the city workings, um, just getting me in there, putting faces to names. Everyone knows that there's a new sustainability coordinator. They just don't know who I am, you know? And so, um, you know, there's a lot of things that we want to do, but uh, I, I don't want people to, to see my name pop up in an email or a phone call and be like, oh, this, this green girl again, you know, like, so I want them to understand that I'm not just always going to ask, 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 you know, it's going to be, there, there, are there are relationships that have to develop here, so. Yeah. Truthfully. Do we know how soon your name will be added to the website? Oh, Ooh, that's a good. It. I did see that. <laughs> I saw that too, and I think it needs to be changed. Yeah. Sure. Good note. Yeah, um, I wonder if I we think could do a little intro in, in, in the newsletter of you or something, just a little introduction yeah. of you, with your, your face and let people know and how they can sure. get in touch with you if they have Probably questions. Have any newsletter. Absolutely. Yeah. We were, we were talking about it, but I don't think that it happened because of um, Robin, Robin departed. The newsletter? Yeah. yeah. Oh. Mm. Where was Did she put one out already? I, I, I do don't not. think so because we haven't so. seen it. Yeah. So I think she was going to, but it didn't happen. Oh, it's going to be one. part of our engagement with the public, mm -hmm. just to have something, at least a, a newsletter online, maybe, was it quarterly? Something okay. like that. Yeah, okay. just, just to update the public on what's going on with the sustainability plan. Sure. Mm -hmm. That's an, and, well, and those are sometimes nice just because they you can access people who may not be able to come to certain events for whatever reason, you know, that sort of thing. So you're hitting more targets, if you will. So we've got newsletter, potential for yard waste policy. We'll, I'll double check and make sure that okay. if it's topical, we'll bring it as an agenda item. If it's kind of the ship has sailed, we'll, I'll update y'all as rapidly Thank as you. possible. Um, public engagement and first thoughts on sustainability plan implementation for agenda items. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. Mm -hmm. Good. And, um, okay. Okay, are there any staff comments? Uh, yeah, I, I do wanna talk a little bit about uh, the transition. We're very excited. Um, you know, we've, we've given uh, Jordan quite a lengthy task, a uh, list of tasks to like start working on. So we're gonna, she's gonna be working through the, the action plan. Um, looking at all the different items, we've already st reached out to, um, uh, you know, some other, we've met, got our, an introduction to a lot of sustainability professionals in the area today in our Living Shorelines tour. Um, she's going to be working through a lot of the other regional documents to get a grasp on, like, what's going on regionally and start uh, getting herself involved in some of the, uh, you know, like, Pinellas County Sustainability Networks and some of the regional sustainability networks, and uh, we're very excited. And um, yeah, she's doing great. And uh, the other thing we did want to share is we had a great trip to Felipe Park today mm -hmm. uh, to discuss to do a Living Shoreline tour. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a very cool project. Uh, they did some interesting pilots uh, with uh, different types of um, 
oyster beds and things like that. And uh, they had some cool lessons learned, and we took some good knowledge away from that on uh, you know how to implement li- living shoreland projects as like a kind of a first cut what their kind of lessons learned were and funding opportunities and things like that. So it was a very positive experience. I have a lot of oysters in um, in front of my yard in the bay. You can come. <laughs> Is there good fishing? <laughs> That's a great place to visit. It was great. Did you get to go up on the mound? Uh, We didn't go up the mound, but we were at the seawall right there. Mm -hmm. And the gorgeous trees. It was was fantastic. Uh, There was a, I mean, it was just, I'm still not quite used to all of the the new flora and fauna Mm -hmm. in in Mm -hmm. Florida. So it's like especially fun because I'm like crawling into the mangroves because I saw um, a horseshoe crab mm-hmm. like shell mm-hmm. um and it's just cool stuff like that you know i'm like a kid again almost like oh my gosh look at this and there was uh, there are sponges and just super cool things but um uh but yeah it was beautiful and and really they have done a great job of um a multifaceted approach as far as they're looking into the immediate you know two to five years to try and increase you know the oyster population mm-hmm. but they are also doing um studies on the uh, wave current strength and that sort of thing Mm -hmm. so just really just uh, it's it's all tied in and it's all applicable but there's some long-term data that everyone in the area will be able to utilize and and that sort of thing lots of people come out and Mm -hmm. work on that yeah yeah Yeah, they had they said they had a really great voter turnout lots of people i think dr robinson yeah he's done that many times okay he used to be on our committee yeah that's awesome i mean it sounded like a great day it sounded like them like you know there's a lot of of loading of the oyster bags but then a lot of you know ferrying them out on little yeah. like dock platforms and what a nice way to spend the day there's this whole production line yeah i've been there when they've done that i was there for another reason <laughs> it's so of, cool though it's yeah very I mean, cool it's, it's nice to see the community come together mm-hmm. for those things and yeah. we could do that here absolutely absolutely engagement absolutely Is that oh, that's all i have for okay. staff comments yeah um any um i do committee comments I, I wasn't going to, but given what we talked about today, um, you know, I'm Robert and I are having a show um, called Circle of Water at Florida Wildlife Quarter. It opens on October 14th, runs through January 13th, I believe. And um, one of the things, the mi- sort of centerpiece in it, because uh, there's this 60 foot wall and it's what, 13 feet high. So we're doing a 12 foot high, 10 foot wide, but it'll continue on map of Florida, Mm. where the only thing depicted is all the water. Mm -hmm. And there's so much water and it's, we're hand done. And um, so it's to look at how, and it's also the ocean because most of our work's been on ocean and the Gulf and the warming of the water. But now we're looking at the relationship of the ocean to the water inside of Florida and salt intrusion. And there's, so I keep asking about brackish water because I'm indicating the brackish water and the ocean and then the inner. Mm -hmm. But um, I'm also going to have Al Hine, who is emeritus from the Marine College who's written books about the geography of Florida and the water. And he and I will have a conversation, we'll have two parts, and all about this issue of the aquifer and um, salt intrusion and what to do and intrusion wells. And and so that's very exciting. Um, So, and then there's other stuff stuff about all the ways to mitigate and absorbing CO2 that will be in the show. And it's all connected with Florida Wildlife Corridor, which is all about mm. protecting Florida and making sure that all the animals have ways to migrate and get fed and contribute to, um, to the, the state. And where is um, the show going to be? Florida Wildlife Corridor's new um, offices are in the factory in St. Pete, Mm. which is part of the um, Art Warehouse District. Mm -hmm. It's where Fairgrounds is and 
and they are opening a gallery, so they built a gallery. We'll be the in, in inaugural show for that, mm -hmm. so it's and it's a beautiful mm -hmm. gallery. And they have um, Noelle Smith, who just retired from Contemporary Art Museum. She's the curator. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's um, so. I mean, it all fits into what we're talking about with the water. But I never realized till I making this map how much water is in Florida, how much swamp, and mm -hmm. you know, without the swamps, and there are, mm -hmm. s there are carbon sinks, and mm -hmm. you know, they're just everywhere. And it's so interesting, because we just came back, I'm chatting a bit, well, from just one moment, Oklahoma. Chair. Should we um, move to extend our meeting? We're at 7.30, isn't that when we're supposed to end? Eight. Eight. Oh, eight, perfect. Go ahead, carry so on. So coming chat. back from Oklahoma in the airplane now, the only thing I see is water. I, I, you know, I never looked at water before in this way, mm -hmm. but it's so interesting to not look at land yeah. and just look at water. Well, thank you. That's exciting. It is. It has the most spring day of anywhere in the world. It does. It's so, mm -hmm. it's Incredible. like just so much. I mean, some of these panels, they're just all blue. There's no like, where's the land? It's fascinating. Probably. Yes, I just uh, I had a curiosity about uh, the other alternate, mm -hmm. yeah. and I'm just wondering if we if she's not checking in or watching these virtually or whatever, um, if we sh shouldn't put her back in circulation or suggest that maybe see if the commission can bring in someone who might be interested who could be present. Uh, Paul uh, and I were working on that today. Um, we've got. A plan. We're going to be discussing that with the city clerk uh, probably tomorrow, maybe Monday. All so, right. but that's Thanks. that's definitely in the works. Good, good, good. Great. And um, I'm sure anybody that reads the Beacon might have noticed there was a um, guest um, editorial, "Climate Victory: A Lesson for Florida," and it was about the uh, power of the state um, ultimately residing with the people and a decision that happened in Montana that uh, that represented. The youth, mm -hmm. you know, to right. have a right, you know, it goes back to mm -hmm. um, something that Miss Wilcox was mm -hmm. mentioning, you know, regarding uh, policy. You know, there's there are courses in protecting the rights of Mother Nature. Yes, yes. and um, this was really a fantastic. Um, decision, you know, because they had an amendment in 1972 to the Montana um, Constitution, and that was in violation of the young people's right to have a future mm -hmm. of clean air and clean water. And mm -hmm. I mean, I don't have my glasses on right now, and I don't know where I've put them, so I can't give you more details on it. But it was from two mm -hmm. papers ago, I think. Right. And it was it was it excellent. Was it was very news. very encouraging. That I mm -hmm. I feel um, a lot of our young people, if we could if we could engage them, mm -hmm. they're going to get on board, and we're going to see a whole ge a new generation of mm -hmm. um, really people, young people that are really protecting the planet for future generations, mm -hmm. and they will have they have a reason to. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're looking around and they're being affected every day by the things that they're seeing, you know, the, by the changes in the climate. Mm -hmm. We've seen them in the 10 years that we've lived here in Florida, just dramatic changes. So I'm mm -hmm. sure that they're, you know, everyone is taking notice now. Mm -hmm. I was at International mm -hmm. Mall and I, and I was buying something and the young woman who checked me out, she looked at me and she said, you're an artist, aren't you? I said, yes. <laughs> and, she sa and she said, well, what do you do? And I said, well, I make art about climate change. And she said, I'm into climate change. I want to know all about it. I want to go to that show. I'm like, and I was like, wow. You know, just what <laughs> you're great. saying. Yes. You know, young people are really taking note of that because, I mean, it's scary. But they're ignited, and mm -hmm. and I think with a decision like that, yes, we're going to see more and more involvement and more lawsuits by young mm -hmm. people. Well, and it sets a precedent. It I mean, certainly that's does. Huge in the world of law, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're talking about right. 
people actually being able to put into tangible mm-hmm. court cases victories. You know, like this right. is. I mean, this can. It's 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 less of an uphill climb now. This yes, is, it is this created a step versus a just mm-hmm. a slippery slope to slide down. You know, mm-hmm. it was a step up. So it really was. Sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So we are so at. Maybe. Uh, if we can get a new person, maybe we could get a young person. Not that I'm not young, but um, mm. maybe we could get a, you know, someone in college um, who would like to be on our committee or in high school so that they can be the people who step in to take over. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, I, I would also point out, I mean, obviously, y'all have been pretty good at uh, – self-recruiting to the committee um so uh whatever decided ultimately the board does decide so if you guys have you know folks that are interested or that you know um you know once if we get to that point where we have a membership uh or a opening relatively soon you know i would definitely reach out and discuss it with individual board members if that's the the will of the members of the committee it, is it possible for people to put applications in whether there's an opening or not just so that there's um, those that are waiting in the wings because I think all of our terms are um, you know had expired a long time ago and we've continued mm. so I, I'm just thinking I that we think we so. will for some of us oh, you, have? you know I don't know I know for Dory and for um, dr. Robertson but they got renewed Robinson I do believe right. they were renewed. They so were renewed. Uh, okay. I think w- we can have that discussion with the city clerk. Uh, they're they're in charge of all the all these committees. So we'll uh, that's that's a good question. We'll we'll look into that for like a, a point of order. Mm-hmm. Thank you. And I know when I Thank moved you. from alternate to full time member, I got renewed. It renewed, right? Right. right that's so true. There's renewals. So one more thing. More comments. Is, is yeah. that the um, the city clerk? Like from time to time, puts out announcements of what committees are looking for members, or just mm-hmm. kind of stir it up a little bit, let people know. Well, we, we can definitely have that discussion. I'm not sure what their yeah, policies are for recruiting right now. I know the positions; they tend not to come open very all that often, you yeah. know. So, um, yeah, most of the committees have long tenured folks, really two, three year memberships. So we can we can look into that process for sure. Okay. We've reached yeah. the end of our agenda here, and I oh. don't know whether, we, do we need a motion? I yes, we do. Motion to adjourn this meeting. <laughs> and I'll second it. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you very much for being here. We sustain the sustainability. We sustain. <laughs> 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 and, and, you know, we ended 8, not 7.30. <laughs>